So um, did we start the recording? Yes. yes. Okay. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Catherine Strom, Katie Strom. Um, and I am hosting today for Eric Haas, uh, who had something that came right up to five o'clock. So he just wanted to make sure, you know, just in case things ran over. So he'll be joining us momentarily. Um, but in his absence, I'm going to um, go through our introduction. And so um, welcome to our Radica uh, Radical Educator Speaker Series for 2023. Uh, and our theme this year is thinking differently in education, relationality, intersectionality, and pluriversality. Um, so let me go ahead and share this, uh, start the slideshow. Okay. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to Alejandro Oribe, who is going to read our land acknowledgement. Yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, we acknowledge and honor the Halkin and Ergen, the ancestral and unceded land of the Ramatush and Mawika and Ohlone people, the successors of the sovereign Verona Band of San Francisco and East Bay counties. They are the true stewards of this land, past, present, and future. We also acknowledge the violence and generational, generational effects of colonialism, historical and ongoing. There are many ways to dismantle the impacts of colonialism and white supremacy. For example, hashtag land back, land back movement and honor indigenous people. We recognize that every member of the Bay Area community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding. Consistent with our values of community inclusion and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to native peoples. We thank you for taking a moment of acknowledgement and we hope you celebrate honor and stand in solidarity with all indigenous people with their struggles to reverse the adverse colonial legacies affecting all people of color in Hayward, the greater Bay Area, California, the United States, and the Americas, as we gather and reflect on the sacred lands of the Mawika Ohlone tribe, Aho. Thank you so much, um, Alejandra, for that. And um, another of our doctoral students, a uh, second year student, Babalwa Quinelli, will be um, in our chat today and then facilitating our Q&A um, after Dr. Bang's talk. Um, so just really quickly, I want to go over sort of the history of the Radical Educator Speaker Series. So uh, it was created in 2017 um, by a co-written grant, an A2E2 grant that funded our first speaker series, um, which uh, featured the folks that you see here, Dr. Jacqueline Roebuck-Sacco, Dr. Patrick Kamanyan, uh, and Dr. Michael Dumas. Um, and then uh, we had a bit of a break and picked it up again in 2019-2020. We had Dr. Kucha Riesling-Baldi, Dr. Anthony Ocampo, and Dr. Um, Farima Por Korshid. In 2021, we had a great um, bunch of folks. We had actually several panels. So the first panel, we had Dr. Krista Lara, Dr. Freeman Korshid came back again, and then we had um, Dr. Uh, David Stovall. Um, we then brought in um, some, some local educators and activists, uh, Ramona Bishop, John Jones III, Jesse Fernandez, um, and researcher Ijeoma Onunuju. Um, and then we had Dr. Lara back again and Dr. Muhammad Khalifa. And then finally, last year, um, we had Kazu Haga, um, our own Diana Recouver, and again, uh, David Stovall, who you know has been powerful every time he's come to visit us. This year, um, we had Tara Yoso, who joined us in February, Mariama Kaba, March 8th, and of course today, Megan Bang. Uh, our social justice principles frame our work here at uh, CSU East Bay in our uh, Department of Educational Leadership. And there's five of them, uh, the trans, uh, acknowledging the power of transformative language, the necessity to transform systems, um, the importance of empowering minoritized perspectives, 
the imperative of community solidarity, and of course, the importance of our own critical reflection. Um, I'd also like to um, go over our definition from our uh, of abolitionist leadership from our abolitionist uh, leadership working group, um, which has also been connected with the RESS. Abolitionist leadership recognizes that schools are microcosms of an anti-Black carceral society, and that carcerality structures every part of our educational system. These carceral structures create dehumanizing conditions and have material bodily consequences for Black children. Abolitionist leadership seeks to disrupt and dismantle the carceral state and in its place, create school structures and practices that center, love, and affirm the full humanity of Black children and the Black community. Ultimately, abolitionist leadership seeks the universal and collective emancipation of Black communities and all oppressed peoples. Um, finally, join us at CSU East Bay. Um, if you are uh, a member of the community here today, we offer multiple um, educational leadership programs, a preliminary admin services credential or PASC, a master's in educational leadership, the administrative services clear credential or the tier two, which is known as ASC, and then finally our EDD, the educational doctorate in educational leadership for social justice. And we'll put those links in the chat. Okay, and then that brings us up to the present to Dr. Megan Bang's talk uh, towards cultivating just, sustainable, and thriving worlds, reimagining and designing educational possibilities with communities. So I have the immense pleasure of introducing Dr. Megan Bang this evening. I first came across Dr. Bang's work in her co-authored book, Who's Asking? Native Science, Western Science, and Science Education which explores the cultural situatedness of science and makes an argument for approaching science from a pluriversal stance. Pluriversal meaning a world in which many worlds fit or many ways of knowing and being. So I've been following her work ever since and she's someone who's influenced and pushed my thinking in terms of how to disrupt traditional Western epistemologies in science and research more generally and is also someone I really admire and look up to because she's able to show in very concrete community-centered ways how we can bring those pluriversal pers perspectives and especially those grounded in indigenous epistemologies into our classrooms. So Megan Bang of Ojibwe and Italian descent is a professor of the learning sciences at Northwestern University and is currently serving as the director of the Center for Native American and Indigenous Research. Dr. Bang studies foundational dynamics of culture, learning, and development across the life course, particularly with respect to the natural world. She has been especially interested in knowledge organization, reasoning, and decision-making about complex socio-ecological systems and their intersections with identity, cultural variation, history, and power. In her work, these issues are central to the challenges of the 21st century, such as climate change, adaptation, and sustainability, as well as the kinds of social and civic relations intertwined with these issues. She utilizes this foundational work towards improving STEAM education, pre-K-16, in formal and informal learning environments. Further, she brings these programs into teacher education programs, as well as educational leader preparation programs. She has been especially focused on regenerating indigenous systems of education for the 21st century. She currently has several major projects across multiple states, developing indigenous STEAM learning environments and professional learning opportunities, as well as a multi-state project developing interdisciplinary place-based education for PK-5 students in schools called Learning in Places. Dr. Bang served as the Senior Vice President of the Spencer Foundation and is currently the Senior Advisor to the Foundation. She's a Mellon Distinguished Scholar in the Center for Imagination in the Borderlands at Arizona State University. Dr. Bang is a member of the National Academies of Education and a member of the Board of Science Education at the National Academy of Sciences, as well as a mother, auntie, grandmother, sister, daughter, cousin, and partner. Welcome. Um, I hope you will join me uh, in welcoming Dr. Bang today. And with that, I will stop my share and then I will pass it over to you. Right. Um, 
So uh, thanks everyone for having me tonight. Really excited to share work with you. Um, and I just want to start um, by telling you a little bit about who I am. And I like to always bring my family and my ancestors into um, talks because I get I still get a little nervous about this. So. Um, my name is Megan. Thank you for that very long introduction. Um, I appreciate that. There's some things that I don't have to tell you now. Um, but I wanted to start just by saying that um, I come to this work um, and to this talk um, as um, a person who has seen education as the source of some of the greatest harms inflicted on Indigenous peoples. Um, and I really like to think about what will it take for education to actually contribute to our thriving and well being. Um, in current times. Um, I'm the granddaughter of boarding school survivors, the sister-in-law um, to boarding school survivors. Um, and I sometimes start there because not everyone understands that we're talking about schools that were going until the 1980s. They were talking about survivors of the school systems that were set out to eradicate us um, and people who are alive today that um, have experienced those. So um, the transformation of education is not a long distant thing. We are, um, many of us in communities are still um, really living with the trauma of what education has been for us. So this is my crazy family, and I just like to start there. Um, and I am coming to you from Chicago, which are actually part of my um, broad ancestral territories of the Great Lakes originally. Um, so uh, you said this already, but you know I, I'm really interested in what are the central possibilities and, and challenges of the 21st century. And for me, I think a lot about what it means for us to cultivate just culturally thriving and sustainable communities given the challenges of climate change, particularly in a country that's pretty much had our head in the sand about that forever. Um, so I think a lot about how can and should education contribute to socioecological change, um, and how can education contribute to family communities and the earth thriving? Um, and as I mentioned, I do a lot of this myself. So I don't just study it, but I'm designing learning environments with communities. I teach, I um, just got out of a class. I was teaching in a high school um, and ran back to give this talk. Um, because I really think that we need to figure out how to actually teach and learn towards the aspirations that we have. Um, and so for me, what you're gonna hear tonight is really this basic idea is that I think a lot about the way we reason and construe relationships between what we might call um, the natural world or the more than human world and the cultural world or the human world. And for a long time, I've been after studying these two core cognitive models and the ways in which they shape thought, practice, action, um, which on the one hand is what we call apart from models. And I'll say more about this in a few minutes. And um, the second a part of. Um, and the reality for me and what I think a lot about is how these core cognitive models create our social ecological systems, which the right, you don't need to make sense of it, but it's just a representation of all the ways that we construct knowledge about the natural world, but also how we construct social systems and social relationships. And at the core for me, Coloniality and in, in, in the US context, settler coloniality and racial capitalism have facilitated the domination of apart from models as part of routine life. Um, so tonight what I'm gonna try to do is give you a little bit more about the broad perspectives informing my work. I'm gonna try to come down, not try, I'm gonna show you a little bit about how I study cultural variation and knowledge systems. And I do this to, partly to get that, some of the theoretical work down into uh, what it looks like in a three-year-old to reason and see variation in knowledge systems and their, and their consequences. Um, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, learning environments that I've been building for a long time. Um, so I started here a little bit, and I guess partly what I want to just say is that um, these differences in cognitive models of human relationships with the natural world shape everything, and they have shaped everything over time. Um, as an educator, so they shape how our, our cities are built, how our, what we think is a good way to travel, what we think a good um, way of eating or producing food, all of those things are shaped by this core relation. Um, and for me, um, I, I'm really interested in how it shapes human development and cognition and the configuration of learning environments. 
Um, I think about this a lot because on the left, what we call apart from has really facilitated an era of what we might call human supremacy and entitlement to turn life into a natural resource for human entitled use. Um, and we know that the model on the left is associated with unsustainable decision making um, and often unjust decision making. Um, and so for me, this core model and transforming it is the broad scale way to help us adapt in the coming times. To make it clear how it's shaped our education, um, we know a few things. So the image on the top is a typical classroom, a science classroom now. Um, over the last 50 or 60 years, there's been massive decrease in every generation of kids' time outdoors. Um, so we're spending less and less time outdoors um, and it's created what people call a sedimentary bias has all kinds of health impacts. We often talk about the physical health facts, impacts, but more and more they're that there's demonstration that it's got mental health impacts and that the association with how we think and where we think is literally causing shifts in our bodies. Um, there has been really significant documentation about the decline of most people's knowledges about plant and animal life in the 20th century. So we know less now about the natural world than we did 50 years ago as a society. Um, but importantly, it shapes our approach to content learning. The US is invested in lab-based science infrastructure and it's not just in sciences, right? We put kids inside buildings for eight to 12 hours a day to learn. Um, and the point is, is that it, is, it hasn't always looked like that. That is a relatively new human configuration of life that we are just beginning to understand the impacts of. But more importantly, this apart from model has been imposed on indigenous peoples over many generations. And it's really been central to colonialism. And what you're gonna hear a little bit tonight is that for indigenous peoples, our relationships to lands and waters is central to who we are and how we know. So um, schooling as the extraction of children from our lands and waters and our families and communities into buildings um, is another form of carcerality, I would argue, um, just connecting with your opening. Um, and it has, a, it has been the central way in which education has been after eradicating how and what Native people know. So I've been up to for a long time, last almost 25 years, trying to regenerate models of indigenous education with indigenous communities, um, many times outside of formal schooling because the restriction of formal schooling was a lot. But over the last 10 years, I've also been developing learning environments in schools that normalize indigenous presence in school systems. And I'll say a little bit more about that, but I'm gonna really lean towards the indigenous models of education. One thing that I wanna say is, it's probably important for us to hold about how did apart from models become dominant? And one of the key narratives across many bodies of literature now and, and scholarship that are not just an indigenous, uh, not just indigenous scholars is recognizing that there's been a long scale shift um, of what people call the transformation of kin relations as being the center of human activity to institutional configurations um, and knowledge systems based on human supremacy and entitled extraction. So for me, I'm really interested in understanding that, that arc and that trajectory and recognizing the deep structures that keep it in place. Good news is I also see some deep hope and some really interesting things happening at kind of the edges of even Western disciplines where there's real shifts happening in understanding core phenomena, um, whether it's in kind of legal studies or economic or scientific paradigms, towards recognizing that actually fractured knowledges um, have produced wrong knowledge and that there are deep ways in which um, things that we used to think were true, uh, even Western scientists are coming to recognize their deep bias. Um, one of my favorites is uh, this recent piece in Nature around the colonial how colonial history and global economics has completely distorted the database of deep time biodiversity. And most of what we know about biodiversity is probably inaccurate. So really interesting. Really interesting. What's that? No. Okay, okay. Um, so as I continue here, I think one of the key issues that I, I want to make sure people are holding um, is that the US teaches place defined by indigenous erasure and absence towards human supremacy is the argument that I would make. And it's recreating not only problems for indigenous folks, but recreating social and ecological problems for everyone. 
So really at the end of the day, I'm after, can we develop educational models that contribute to indigenous peoples thriving that are no longer in service to settler colonialism? And so what do I mean by that? Um, only 50% of states in the United States require teaching about indigenous peoples and 87% of those standards are pre-1900. We have an education system that either teaches non-existence of indigenous peoples or only historical um, uh, images of Indians, which perpetuates particular forms of thought. In fact, 2019 study, even in social studies, 73% of eighth grade teachers say they never or once a year mention native people. It is a funky thing to think we can get to uh, a racially just society if, you're not, if you don't know anything about native people. And just to say this for anyone in the audience, there are currently 573 federally recognized tribes within the borders of the United States and another 185 state recognized tribes and another couple hundred still working or fighting for recognition. There are many living indigenous peoples and it is not central to US education at all right now. And for us and partly what I think is really important for everyone to hold just last year um, and two years, the past year and a half, um, there are really significant levels of policy changing that have implications for what we should be teaching in US education. Um, in 2021, the US started, the White House started this series of commitments to ele elevating indigenous knowledge and federal policy decisions, which means we're moving towards a federal level, at least through the White House, um, of recognizing indigenous peoples at a fully different scale. Um, often what I tell people is uh, most people don't know the US was the was the country alongside Canada, New Zealand, and Australia that tried to uphold the UN, uh, to prevent the UN's declaration of indigenous rights because these nations have the most to figure out. Um, so it wasn't until the Obama administration that the US decided we had a right to remain indigenous. So the point about this, um, and what I think our school systems really don't understand yet because we uh, collectively people have been miseducated about this, is that talking about native peoples isn't just good for native kids. It's actually central to civic reasoning in the United States. And it becomes really important to think about how not only do we actually create models of education for native kids or indigenous children, but what does it mean to create education with indigenous presence for everybody? I'm gonna go down a different layer about this. Um, my biggest worry is that the continued invisibility of indigenous people is creating new conditions for indigenous sacrifice and new forms of land theft and indigenous harm during eras of climate change. I'd like to show this map. The areas of purple are all indigenous controlled territories across the globe. 80% of the world's biodiversity is in indigenous territories. Um, and partly why this matters is that when we can't see indigenous peoples, both in the US, but also globally, we reason with the absence, but not everyone knows. And not everyone is, is reasoning with this absence. If we track what's happening in places like Brazil or developments in other parts of the world in indigenous controlled territories, people still want what's in our lands. Um, and so we really can miss significant pathways for adaptation, sustainability, and justice. Okay, so that's big picture. Now I'm gonna try to dive in to show you um, and talk to you a little bit about, so what's it look like in education and how is it that we can understand indigenous knowledge systems in teaching and learning environments? Um, and what I've really been after here is understanding dimensions of place, relationality, responsibility, and kin. Um, and I'm not gonna say much except for here are my, my heroes and kind of intellectual mentors in lots of ways, um, all, um, all three of which I've really been pleasure, I've had an incredible honor to learn from in different ways. Um, and so I've often, people often say to me, but like, how do you do that? What's it really look like? So I'm gonna tell you and show you a little bit of examples in kid reasoning and then get to learning environments. So I, I, I have really taken up um, understanding what we call axiologies, ontologies, and epistemologies as a way to understand and study knowledge systems. This is really built from um, Brian Brayboy's work, who's really named five, and I'll get to pedagogy. I will tell you, I'm not going to talk about cosmology because I don't think cosmology, I don't think academic talks are the place to talk about cosmology yet, um, maybe when I'm older. Um, but axiologies, just to give you kind of a quick, like, I know these are big terms. What are axiologies? Axiologies are just what we value ethically. Um, but it shapes our knowledge by what we value, what questions we ask, what we wonder about, what we think is worth knowing. 
ontologies are kind of our fundamental beliefs about what is real or true and how we implicitly or unconsciously enact those beliefs in activity um, or everyday activity. And epistemology is what we know and how we come to know it. Okay, so you might be like, all right, it's a lot. So let me see what you mean. Um, so I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna say a little bit about what epistemic actions are and how I study this. So epistemic actions are the little ways that people make meaning in interaction, like in discourse. And this really builds from an idea from Chuck Goodwin's um, idea that these substrates or semiotic landscapes, our interaction, our dialogue with each other form the ground for knowing. Um, and that through these actions, culture and distinctive ways of knowing operating within the world are created, right? It's not just understanding cultural differences, but how does culture and knowledge systems come to be? It's a kind of developmental question. Um, and for me, I like to think about how epistemic actions are intertwined with ontological claims. Um, and really, um, one way to think about this, we've done studies with science teachers uh, where we ask kid, native kids to talk about what their science teachers thought were alive and what their elders thought were alive. And this graph on the right demonstrates that kids know their teachers in school think fundamentally different things than elders. Right, so in indigenous knowledge systems, we tend to have ontological claims about what is living, has personhood or communicative capacities that Western knowledge systems have historically rejected. Okay, so that's an example of an ontological claim. Partly what's important to hold about this is that your ontological claims, what uh, structure, what you imagine or what people have talked about as addressivity and answerability um, it means that you think about um, both a listener and a speaker's conceptual horizon, and I'm going to show you examples about this, um, and you imagine the language of each other. And on the right, what you can see is kind of my favorite nerdy revolution that's happening right now in plant biology is we used to not, Western science used to think that plants weren't, uh, didn't have communicative capacity, didn't communicate with, them, with each other or across species. Here's the thing. In the last 20 years, it's been totally debunked and people are sort of freaking out about trying to understand how is it that plants are engaged in the complex behaviors that they are. And what you're seeing in some of these titles is like, wait, what happens if we actually understood the plant world as conscious, as capable of, com of, of intentional communication? That's what I mean by ontological claims. Before we couldn't, the Western world couldn't imagine it, so you didn't ask questions about it and it's slowly been shifting. Axiological positionings are who matters, what decides, who decides, right? It's really basically about what our ethics are. And part of what I draw on here is that um, when we think about social contestation um, is how is it that we rupture routine modes of articulation that actually undermines the deepest grounds of an ideological claim for the necessity of some formation. And in large part, what I'm doing tonight is trying to argue and hopefully change your paradigm about whether you can see indigenous absence and whether you think that indigenous presence is actually an ethical responsibility of the United States. So um, partly why I say that is that these three dimensions of knowledge and knowledge systems shape sociopolitical and ecological possibilities. And there's all kinds of interesting things happening in the world about trying to remake relations between the human world and the natural world given climate change. Okay, so you might be like, okay, I, I'm not sure where you're going and I don't know how to follow you yet, but let me, let me just say, the design of learning environments is making decisions about axiologies, ontologies, and epistemologies all the time. In fact, when we engage in teaching and learning, what we are doing is privileging particular AOEs. So let's see it, okay? So we've been studying this in different ways and I'm gonna go show you an example. Um, and this is a really um, simple task. I started out as a preschool teacher, so I love babies, actually like them better than grownups most of the times. Um, but I like to show this, this work partly because it makes sophisticated ideas present in three-year-olds. So this is a really simple diorama play task. We ask children and an adult, a caregiver, um, to play with this diorama. For those of you who might know cognition and development, this is like a replication of old studies that made lots of basic claims. In this diorama, there are three kinds of species, what we call native species, that is actual animals that should live in a forest ecosystem, uh, in a North American forest ecosystem, exotics or, or animals that should not live in a North American forest ecosystem and domestic, like a cow. 
Um, there's also trees and bushes and water and rocks. So they're what people call natural kinds. We did the study with three groups, um, an urban native community, um, an urban non-native, uh, primarily European American community and a rural native community. Um, and what I'm gonna show you um, is a couple of things. So one, we've been studying placing relationships, which we would call an epistemic action. Um, and it's really reasoning driven by place-based relations. Remember, we often talk about indigenous knowledge systems are connected to uh, lands and waters. So I'm gonna show you what that looks like in microinteraction. Um, but next to those epistemic actions also come along what we call belonging and needs or axiological positionings. This thing we call perspective taking, which is also an epistemic action where you take on someone else's viewpoint. Um, and what that comes along with is if you think that um, more than humans have internal states, you engage in perspective taking. I'm gonna show you this. And then what happens is differences in knowledge organization over time. Okay, so here's an example of a three-year-old and her dad, it's 30 seconds, gonna show you this, and then we'll show you her by herself. I'll just say they're a ways in. This is, they've been playing. If you can see all of those animals are already on the diorama. Okay, so here's an example of knowledge organization. What we see constructed here is, is actually the beginning of a food web, right? Um, this parent and kid um, are talking about uh, eating relations that look like this. Just to give you a counter example, what an urban non-native uh, interaction, similar content knowledge where a parent says, what is this? Child says an eagle, what do eagles eat fish and what do fish eat worms? That's right, good job. Um, and what you see here is a linear chain or a food chain. Part of what the point is, is that this difference in interaction in 30 seconds has long-term consequences in cognitive infrastructure. Um, and just wanna be clear that that's partly what I mean by understanding the differences in cognitive models and forms of reasoning over time. So in 30 seconds, we see some core structural differences, but I wanna go a little bit deeper. So partly what we see here is um, the parent asked the child, is the Magisi hungry? Um, he asked her to, to take the perspective of the eagle and interpret its internal state. Um, and she holds it. She says he's trying to find some fish. We used to think 20 years ago that three-year-olds weren't capable, cognitively capable of taking the perspective and reasoning about the internal state of someone else. We also can see an important shift here. So the parent starts out with which one is it? So there's non-person, the kiddo introduces indigenous language and we see a shift. The rest of what follows after there is personhood throughout, both of the kid and the parent, where we're referring now to the Megisi with his and who, that's a form of recognizing personhood, not it or what. Um, and what we saw in this study is that both urban and rural native people do this at least once. They do it many, many times densely, but just in this basic analysis in 15 minutes, we just coded, did they do it once? And did non-native people do it once? And so in just 15 minutes, there's huge variation about routine interactions and the ascriptions. Part of what I wanna show you too, and this took me and a while to see this, is um, there's also axiological positioning based in this. So this parent asks, you know who else could find some fish? What? I don't know. Let's see who else eats some fish. Part of what we're getting at and what is important to notice here is that the routine taking up of wondering about other needs or others in relationship to interaction is all over these young children's interactions with their adults. Um, and part of why we think that becomes important is that you start to recognize that there's an intertwining of knowledge organization with these basic ideas around axiological or ethical um, inclinations to ask about who else, who else is impacted here. Bindalorius said a long time ago, for the responsibility of our species to perform responsible tasks with respect to each other, to each form of life that we encounter, learning from them the basic structure of the universe. 
and, and ensuring that they receive in return the respect and dignity accorded to them. And this acknowledgement of the dignity of other life forms, which is simple but profound recognition, underlies all Indian attitudes towards the organic world. He wrote this a long time ago, but for many of you, if you don't know, Vine Delore is kind of, I feel like he's the godfather academic of, of indigenous peoples. But part of what I wanna just make clear is I would argue this is what a three-year-old's beginning indigenous knowledge systems towards what um, Deloria was talking about looks like. Okay, so now I'm gonna try to get to learning environments. Hopefully I've shown you a little bit about like what I mean in detail and you'll see more. So what have I really been up to? I've been after developing land and water-based models of education or a part of models. So what would it mean to no longer put kids in buildings for the majority of their time and think about learning? And really this is based in ideas from Deloria and lots of other people. There's a real movement towards land-based education. I've been doing this for a while. Um, but I think it's important to understand that indigenous education is not indigenous or education from within our intellectual traditions unless it comes through the land, unless it occurs in an indigenous context using indigenous processes. We should be concerned with recreating the conditions with, within which this learning occurred, not merely the content of the practice itself. Here's why that matters, right? Most of what's happening in school reform, which I also participate in, so I'm not knocking everybody about this, is we are driven by epistemology. What are our content standards? Not actually our pedagogy and not actually the relational conditions that gave rise to indigenous knowledge systems. So while, I would, uh, while shifting what gets learned is necessary, it won't be sufficient to regenerate indigenous models of education. And that's partly what I've been up to. Um, and partly why I think this is good for everybody, not just indigenous kids, by the way, I have lots of, I'm doing this in lots of schools, is there's all kinds of benefits. And I'm not gonna say all of this, but part of what happens is that humans reason differently outdoors. Humans also feel different outdoors. Um, and so what we've been up to is really thinking about how is it that we develop land-based or a part of models of education um, driven by what we call should we questions that motivate the need for scientific investigations and ethical decision making um, and really think about what does it mean to learn with the land. More specifically for in what I've been focusing on what I'm going to spend the rest of my talk on tonight is around indigenous models of education and thinking about an idea I call pedagogical sovereignty. Scott Lyons has talked about this for a while and that he's that he's really put forth this, this idea, pedagogical sovereignty and self-determination really asks us to rethink not only the what, but the how we teach and whether or not or how it is that we're gonna regenerate models of education. So I'm gonna tell you about Indigenous STEAM because it's kind of the work that I'm trying to do here. Um, this particular project has been around co-designing and implementing um, land and water-based learning environments that are really after our well-being. We engage families, we engage elders, we engage community members. We also engage native and non-native scientists and artists as well as educators um, to imagine learning and then implement it and then study it and then redesign it. Um, and we typically have anywhere from 15 to 30 community members as part of that, plus a teaching team that emerges from there. So in these learning environments, they're not, many of the teachers are not sort of degreed teachers. They're community teachers. Um, I said this already, but what we've really been grounded in is regenerating more than human kin relations um, and thinking about like, how is it that we get to relational epistemologies and how do those ontologies and axiologies come around? Um, and so just to get into the specifics, what do what did we design in this particular talk? Um, we tend to have two week summer programs for first through 12th graders, about 40 to 60 students. Um, we're currently in three communities um, that that usually grows and we'll be in about 13 communities in the next couple of years. Um, and what we ask in this particular case are, how are our homelands and waters in the Puget Sound being impacted by climate change and ocean acidification? And what should we do? What are our responsibilities? Um, in this learning environment, kids study biodiversity, ecological systems. They thought about how um, what is happening with tribal leadership and restoration and salmon work in the Pacific Northwest. They thought about land and water management. Um, and they really had to think about like, what's it mean to do those jobs responsibly? So what I'm gonna do, um, I guess one thing, the other thing that you should know is that we always start with indigenous knowledge systems and ways of knowing. Um, we start with story and we're always grounded there, but we also work 
um, to really think about intergenerational learning environments. So age segregation, we would argue is a form of colonial technology. Um, and so our learning environments are integrated by age. Um, we also always engage in what we call making or resurgence of indigenous practices. So these learning environments do both kind of rigorous. I tell people I can get um, six-year-olds to care about the chemical equation of ocean acidification, but they also come out as weavers um, of some of our traditional practices. Um, so I'm gonna share two stories with you today or findings um, and help you see again, indigenous knowledge systems and children's spontaneous sense-making give you a sense of what it feels like to be in land-based learning environments. Um, and then I'm gonna show you a little bit about where we are on reflecting and refining our own pedagogical practice beyond responses um, to colonial negations and how we're really seeing how coloniality and settler colonialism shows up in interaction over and over again. Um, all right, so this story is called Grandma Cedar, Yuna and Her Friends. Um, what you should know is I'm gonna show you some clips from a storyline that was really focused on Cedar and then um, kids doing it in their individual, uh, in smaller groups. And in this storyline, kids learned all about Western red cedar, its role in forest ecosystems and uh, what was happening to red cedar for climate change. Um, red cedar is very important to tribal communities in the Pacific Northwest. So it's a culturally salient relative. Um, and um, really what kids did was learn some of our traditional stories about it, learn about cedar's role in ecosystems, engage in some investigations um, they made and shared with cedar, and then they had to decide how they were gonna uphold their ethical and civic responsibilities. Um, you might wonder um, what our learning materials look like. Um, so this is an example of a, um, a plant ID card that maybe people use in outdoor learning environments, except for we would argue this works better for us. Um, and I would just say to everybody, I think that the design of learning materials is a kind of creative art making in many in many ways, um, that if we think about what the artifacts are that we're infrastructuring, we're, we're conveying values. Um, and in this card, um, the, this is a salmon berry card, but the structure is what's important. Um, our plan ID cards are seasonally and life cycle organized. They're written from the perspective of plants. They include indigenous language, okay? Another example is we have this observation protocol where we're trying to actually support kids noticing and observing uh, holistically um, and to recognize systems um, and relations across time. So I won't spend lots of this, but this observation protocol is not focused on a singular plant. It asks kids to think about a forest canopy and what's growing above a plant. It asks them to think about what's below um, and ask kids to think across seasonal time and the challenges. Um, and then it's, think, it's asking them to think about um, who neighbors are, who other relatives are and what that, what that um, plant does beyond um, itself or itself in relation to humans. Okay, before I show you data, um, this storyline started with Grandmother Cedar, which is a Samish story. And um, just to say this, in indigenous knowledge system stories are our theories. They're actually our frameworks for how to know and be in the world. They're not just fables. Um, they really are encapsulate indigenous knowledge systems. Um, and in our learning environments, we start every, every inquiry with a story um, and then weave that story across instruction. Um, and in this, what you're gonna see is a reference to Grandmother Cedar. What you need to know um, is that Grandmother Cedar, in this story, she's lonely and she wants relatives. She is gifted a grandson to raise and she protects that grandson from too much sun so it doesn't he doesn't burn out, too much wind, too much rain, and actually other animals eating, uh, eating him and his brand new growth. Um, she attends to his emotional well-being by calling over birds and other, other relatives in the forest to sing to him, talk with him, visit with him. And in the story, she grows old and weak and he grows strong. Um, and he demonstrates reciprocity um, for uh, his grandmother in the story. Partly what you should hear is the story shows interspecies relationships of caring, but also competition in food, but also helping in reciprocity. And even in that is an intervention in the Western story of survival of the fittest and evolutionary theory in those basic things. Okay, so now fast forward about 20 hours of instruction. 
where kids are have studied their, uh, on, we use cedar as kind of the model for how to study and learn about plants and build relationships. And then we broke up into small groups and they learned and became expert about another relative and then they had to share. So what I'm gonna show you is a very short clip of two groups sharing um, their new developed expertise together. Um, the first group has an 11, a 13 and a 10 year old. And the second group has a nine, a 12 and an 11 year old. And they are out on a trail, kind of doing like a leapfrog uh, structure to share with each other their expertise. The clip I'm about to show you is they've kind of done all of their teaching and now it's at the end where people are starting to ask questions. So this is sort of spontaneous conversation. So the, uh, the, when the leaves of the maple tree die, they fall on the ground and they compost and that's really good soil for the rest of the plants and over towards here there are sprout rings i'm not really sure of what plant but there's some of it yeah. right around um, um yeah they were also up on that are you guys just like that so. um also, they kind of like the grandma cedar tree, they kind of shield the other plants. So why did they grow in such uh, non-straight ways? What? I believe that's a way that that's kind of, they're trying to help out other plants by um moving around um having the trunk move around so it will cover more areas uh, it could also, also be because they need more sun yeah it's also yeah they need really need more sun. this spread out so that they can get more sun right? and they take it from leaves. Leaves. and so what um, also since, since they um shield it off they when the leaves got it came from the and also uh Okay, so in case you couldn't read it, I'm just going to say a couple of things about this. So Yuna's nine, she just narrated a series of ecological helping relationships. And so she might not have been using academic language, but she's talking about tree life cycles, the ways that it impacts soils and the way that it helps other plants. She's attending how the tree canopy shades sproutlings. And what you should notice here is that trees have internal states. They're trying to help other plants throughout this. And she actually invokes the cultural story as an explanatory for framework for spontaneous sense making. In our mind, kids spontaneously using indigenous stories to engage in sense making is a sign that the learning environment is actually contributing to indigenous thriving. Um, and just to say, no one skipped a beat about that, right? So it also meant that there's cultural reference happening in this learning environment that is shared and held and continually built on. Wanna just point out that um, what we also see here um, is the teacher asks a very standard form function question. Why do the trees grow like this? And what we see is um, a kid's move um, uh, to kind of the classical Western science, because more leaves equals more trunks equals more leaves equals more, more photosynthesis. Um, and so we see a navigation a little bit away from an indigenous knowledge system, I would argue, take up of kind of normative academic language, um, and then a, and then a, and then a return back um, to the communal frame and a little bit of this broader cycle and relationship. And part of what I just want to say about this, the other thing to hold here is that Yuna's nine leading a conversation with 11 and 12 and a 14 year old. Um, and we can really um, see that um, there's an interaction happening here that I'm not sure that we would always think that nine and 14 year olds could be doing together. Um, we also, you wouldn't know this, but the question, are you trying to be sarcastic was actually a relationship that's her older brother. Um, and so they are figuring out each other and we think that, that that's important. But I do want to be clear about this is there is actually deep work here happening where indigenous knowledge systems is the first explanation, but we would argue there's new power paradigms being reconfigured here where engagement with Western scientific kinds of ways of making sense aren't bad, they just don't dominate. Um, 
And the last thing that I'll say about this, uh, maybe two things, sorry, um, is I also think it's important to recognize how our observation protocol played out in activity, right? So we saw in the video that literally, you know, was pointing above, she pointed below, she literally did this around. And part of the reason we think about this as being really important is that our instruments of learning facilitate activity in the world, right? So if we want kids to understand systems in this case, how we ask them to, to notice actually manifests in their behavior. And it's partly for us why designing carefully and thinking about how knowledge system shows up, even in the details of something like an obser observation protocol facilitates activity in the world. Um, the last thing that I, I don't know about this group, but I'm gonna tell you anyway, there's all kinds of really sophisticated standards here. Oftentimes, even in indigenous communities, people get worried about, well, if we did land-based learning environment, are kids gonna fall behind? Are they gonna be able to go to college if they want to? What's gonna happen? Um, and I just wanna demonstrate something. Um, so, so we see Yuna say this thing. So when the leaves of the maple tree die, they fall on the ground and they compost, and that's really good soil for the rest of the plants and over towards here, they're sproutlings. Um, this is actually a fifth grade DCI from, from NGSS. And actually, if we look closer, we can continue to see that she's actually talking about the biosphere. She's talking about soil and sediments. Um, and she's starting to understand how these systems interact in multiple ways to affect the earth's surface and materials and processes. So it's all there in a nine-year-old language. We can keep going, where in this, we're starting to see high school standards and DCIs show up in this interaction. Um, and even more, we can chart in really concrete ways how these align from fifth grade standards all the way up to high school standards. I have to be honest, I'm not a big fan of standards, but I also feel like what I often hear from folks is like, how do we do this within the systems as they are? And I like to demonstrate that actually, if we put land first, we can still accomplish all those other things because indigenous knowledge systems are sophisticated enough to do all of those things. And actually we see kids engage with ideas in ways that they want to be in this way. So um, I'm gonna turn now um, and I think I'm going to go for another 10 minutes or so. Is that is that all right, Kate? So there's about 20. Uh, OK, um, so really part of what I'm after is is thinking about these systems um, and recognizing how is it that we see indigenous kids and our knowledge is thriving in age appropriate ways. And really what I'm after here is demonstrating that we can have our brilliance, our presence and our leadership when designing education for our own our own peoples um, in all kinds of ways. But I want to tell you something else that Yuna taught us about beginnings of learning environments and what they put in motion and the kinds of pedagogical journeys and kind of um, continual learning um, that all of us have been on um, and um, why we think they matter. So probably as educators, many of you start a learning environment. All of us probably do in some ways. I would even argue you could think about it if all you do is run meetings. Meetings can be a kind of learning environment. But how you start really matters. And there's been a lot of research about this. Um, so there's previous work that's demonstrated that how you begin an activity has a profound implication on how learning unfolds. Um, and partly it's because the beginnings provide the origins of a trajectory of learning connected to the earlier point I made about Goodwin, what you give as kind of semiotic resource for sense making builds over time. Um, and partly what our point is here is that most educational spaces focus on the epistemological, the what should be learned, um, and are muted with respect to ontological and axiological dimensions of learning in ways that we have argued replicate Western paradigms. The other reason that we pay attention to beginnings is because many, many indigenous communities, including my own, emphasize beginning protocols and routine practice for a variety of reasons. We start things, in particular ways to make sure we do things in a good way. Um, and we have been moved to continue to learn from our own cultural practices and really recognize the deep knowledge systems in them. So what do we do? We have studied, um, I'll just say this quickly, we're studying ISTEAM and we, um, I'm gonna show you some, some early findings from one year of ISTEAM where we studied 47 activity beginnings with about 1200 data excerpts. Um, they were coded into a bunch of uh, into three primary categories: axiological, ontological, and epistemological. There are a bunch of subcodes under them. I'm not going to explain all of them. They're really not the thing that I want to show you today. I'm going to show you a couple of specifics. So the first thing is 
In our activity beginnings, 90% are focused on have explicit axiological content. Um, and part of our point here is, is that if you think about it, um, everybody puts up your learning goals, not your learning whys. Right. Um, and so for us, this is this axiologic is this ethics, what's the purposes of learning is all over this content. What we've been really after is understanding why all this ethics and how is it that we talk about it. And I'm going to show you a little bit about what we think is happening is a deep attunement to how young people are grappling with knowledge systems and paradigms of coloniality. So what's it look like in, in, in practice? Here's an activity beginning um, at a community center. Um, there were, our activity beginnings often have educators, um, often have multiple educators. And in this activity beginning, I'm gonna show you an example of how we have often had to see um, what we would call a paradigm shift or a paradigmatic shift. Um, uh, so, so here's here's this. I'm not going to play this because the audio is terrible. Um, the teacher uh, introduces uh, the idea of migrations, where we're going to study plant migrations, um, but also starts the learning environment by talking about um, our relationships with families to build it, to build what we're doing, um, and talks about um, the that families wanted us to talk about how did our families migrate to these urban places, to Seattle, or lots of different reasons. And she says, and so one of the things we want to make sure that everyone goes home to and ask, how did your family get to Seattle? And Ross, uh, one child says, oh, well, we didn't really come to Seattle. We came to, it's called the big migration where the, uh, like the West, the South over by, over by Boston and over there, they were getting packed with people. So we had this huge migration, like the Oregon Trail. That's what we call it now, but we just migrated. The teacher says, so you're telling me, wait, what tribe are you again? I'm Yupik, you're Yupik. So actually, where are you pick people from? Child says the north. Yeah, way north, right? Ross says, yeah. So probably actually, you didn't ever start on Boston. Your people are from the north. Ross says, oh yeah, I've never been out of the north. Mia says, yeah, well, so one of the things really important you, and another child is kind of um, vying for attention. She says, Sonia says, I'm also you pick. And I know that some of us started in Alaska. Here's what, what I want you to get. So even this educator starts in indigenous and ontologies but, um, and migrations, but she signals settler time by using the word Seattle. And we see immediately that this child actually thinks about migration within a colonial narrative, right? Is Yupik, this story is not about him at all, but that word triggers a colonial paradigm. And what we see is this educator reframes the student's ontology by gently what we might call replacing them in their communal origins. And what it does is it opens up other contributions by kids. This pivot is all over ice team. And so part of what I'm getting at here is that design learning environments, kids have learned what ontologies are assumed in learning environments. And the work of actually remediating them to indigenate is an ongoing pedagogical practice. Um, I'm gonna show you another example, another quote from this, this same kind of um, opening, it's the same opening. Um, we're a little bit later, Mia is saying, so, and, when, and then how can we think about what we do need to do to make the world we want? What do we want the world to be? And one of the things we're going to, we're going to hear stories, we're gonna probably hear some creation stories. I think Jeanette might tell us one in a couple of days at some point and Roger might, and we're gonna hear stories about how this world came to be. And what I want you all to think about in those stories is what do they teach us about how we should live right now? How do they help us know what it means to change the world and create the world we want? And we heard this morning about how folks like Roger or Abe downstairs who was a teenager they had to start creating this world that when they were kids, they didn't have this. They didn't have daybreak. They didn't have a place where we can come together and talk about these things and think about what it does it mean for us and what do we want to do with it. So we're going to keep thinking about what's the world we want to create. And partly when you're making, when you're doing uh, your art, you can think about that. What's the story with what's the world we're trying to create? So what I wanna point out here is that in our beginnings language, the future, the question of futures is often positioned as a collective endeavor. Um, that often this message of we have ancestral knowledges that help us with this question, that we have ancestors who have done the work of world making and world changing before, so it's not too overwhelming. Um, and we're engaging in creating story art and world making in all of our activities. 
So what I wanna show you as a last piece um, is that partly, so you saw these pivots and you can see these kinds of layerings. I'm gonna show you another example that comes out of this, um, this interaction. Um, and this one is really about salmon and hummingbird and seeing and transforming colonial terms across activity um, and really trying to push towards more than harm stories. So in this story, um, we had been studying and working on clay work. So I'll say a little bit about this. Um, so we were uh, thinking about uh, clay work and continue to think about clay work. Um, and for many tribes, clay has been central to, it's been a central technology. Um, and partly we've been trying to disrupt how making and the sort of paradigms of making actually create apart from paradigms, not a part of, but in indigenous knowledge systems, that's really not the case. Um, and so what we were up to um, is really uh, engaging, um, engaging kids and educators and scientists. Um, and I think it's really important to hold that making and these cultural practices connect us across space and time. And, and we kind of love this quote from one of the hydrologists that was participating. He says, I was able to connect with those that came before me, the manipulating of clay and using my hands in some version of the form that has been done generations and generations ago was incredible. I don't know how else to put it, it was amazing to have that space and time. I don't think I, there has been a time where I was that connected to ancestors. So partly what we're demonstrating here is that we can talk about climate change and ancestors in the same learning environment in powerful ways like this. When we first started doing this though, we realized that we had replicated a kind of representational paradigm, a sort of show and tell. What'd you make, now tell us about it. Um, and the second year we decided to do this, um, we were gonna push on it. Here's the thing, um, one day um, we went and visited um, a tribe's uh, fish hatchery and then there was a restoration site um, led by non-indigenous peoples. And while we were there, um, kiddos found a baby hummingbird and there was um, about nine or 10 little kids under the age of eight kneeled down around this baby hummingbird deliberating about what to do. Um, and everyone was being very careful and very, very upset about this baby hummingbird. Um, I and another teacher had started to try to convince these kiddos that sometimes this is what happens um, to our relatives in the forest, because um, <laughs> I often joke that like any good urban kids right now, they wanted to call the Humane Society and figure out how to save that hummingbird, and we kind of knew that wasn't going to happen when we were deep in the woods, wasn't, wasn't going to happen. Um, the leader of who was uh, taking us there and showing us there, um, who's a non-Indigenous guy, uh, came walking over into the middle of the group, stepped on the baby hummingbird, killed it, picked it up and threw it into the woods. And we had kids burst out into tears, a parent screamed, it was a mess and incredibly inappropriately violent. We don't think that he meant to uh, kill it. I actually think he wasn't paying attention and like just walked in and was like, what are you guys doing? And stepped on it. But he did bend down, pick it up and throw it, throw it, chucked it like it was garbage. The next day we had to clean up about this. Um, and I'm going to show you a beginning and then I'm going to show you a little bit of video. Um, so the next opening circle, um, part of what we did and what we were really careful about, uh, about 40% of our kids are in foster care. Um, and so, so adults that harm them is a story that many of them are working on. And we were really careful to sort of talk about um, understanding that that man wasn't in good relations um, and um, that um, we all make mistakes. Mistakes are part of what human people do, um, that we connected to stories about mistakes that what we learn. Um, and one, what, what the teacher ends up saying is one thing that is really important is how we take responsibility for those mistakes. And maybe Brian didn't mean to kill the hummingbird. Maybe that was a stake, mistake, but he shouldn't have thrown the hummingbird into the words, woods after the mistake. Okay. So what we see actually is kids right afterwards um, uh, talking about that that night um, they were having uh, a hard time falling asleep. Um, and the teacher ends up saying, what do you think? Uh, do you think there's something? What do you think we should do about it? How should we move forward with this? Um, and a student just says, just tell them off once and then go to bed. Um, another student says, all you have to do is tell them off once and watch a movie and then go to bed. Um, the teacher asks, can I ask a question? If you could talk to Brian again, what would you want to tell him? And the kiddo says, I don't really know, but I know what my mama would say. And um, Blink ends up saying, my mom would submit, say bad things. Another teacher ends up saying, Blink also said uh, to have a grave for the hummingbird. Um, and another, and the David student, another student says, we should make a tiny hummingbird memorial. The students do, 
And I'm gonna show you two examples of that. One of which is they commission the clay artist to make a collective hummingbird piece. So I'm gonna show you this and I want you to pay attention a little bit for what is the kind of story that's being told here and what's the pedagogical move that the teacher does to transform the story. So we're doing this so we can have a bowl. So that, cause we're not gonna leave it here, but Janae will be holding it. And next year when we get together in a circle and we put in sage, we can use this bowl. And we'll always remember the hummingbird. He was smart in his own sense, but he was careless. And then one day he was showing these people that came up every year in the summertime. And then when he was when he was showing them how to hope the salmon cover it up, we just won't add any more water. So that's good. I might give it like a final as it's drying out. Yeah. Um, with that, I'll just kind of clean up. Yeah. See that all the little and sometimes the little things make it actually look more realistic. But um, yeah, but I'll, I'll kind of clean, you know, like any little a little thing. I'll try to sweep it off. <laughs> Awesome. The humming I like it. Excellent. Work. Mad, uh, mad at him. So awesome. then those people sent him a letter and then they made graves for the hummingbird and then they never Memorial. Memorials. The man took it up by its tail and threw it into the woods like it was giraffe. What did you learn? You shouldn't step on baby animals. And this story was called the careless man. The careless man named Brad. You can also tell the story about a hummingbird. And imagine everything that it lived before up until the point yeah. that that happened. And yeah. the story there is more about all the life mm -hmm. that the hummingbird had. Like 336. Right? It's like, you didn't say anything special, but. But it's yeah. Goes on. And one of the kiddos says, we shouldn't just name it. It could already have a name. And the teacher says, you know, Irandi's name, her name is Irandi, she has a middle name. Her middle name is Witsili. Multiple kids respond, Witsili. And Witsili is actually Hummingbird. That's her middle name is Hummingbird. Multiple kids are kind of, whoa. And one of the kids that must've been harder. Is that why she said, I have a relationship with Hummingbird? That must've been harder because she has that relationship with Hummingbird. And the teacher says, yes, that's what she talked about. The kiddos ended up giving um, and really gifting, this is their piece, the hummingbird piece that they gave it um, to an elder um, so that she could take it and carry the story of this. And what's important to hold is that um, this process of making a gifting to, share, to carry story and teaching became routine. And kiddos spontaneously started making in ways that actually reflected our knowledge systems beyond a kind of representational show and tell. Um, what I want to also say about this is um, we really worked hard to figure out and to start to see these movements when kids were starting to repeat stories of domination. One thing that you might hear in Brian, this, the story of Brian the Careless Man, is a beautiful kid rendition of the problems of settler colonialism and uh, human domination um, that we're after here. And that is true, and it's a good story. It's a I don't know if it's a good story, but it's a necessary story. But we also see teachers doing this, this pivot towards actually another paradigm. And what was really important to us anyway is here is that when we do that, we start to see kids reconnecting with their own uh, cultural names and seeing that empathy, that who else and starting to see um, from other kids' perspectives here. So in the interest of time, I'm gonna end and just say, hopefully what I've done is show you an arc of these major issues about relational controls between the natural world and the, um, the human world um, and the ways that that sets up power and historicity. And in our case, I'm really interested in transforming coloniality and racial capitalism. And what I really wanna say is I'd like to really, 
um, think about what could we accomplish in the coming decades. And we often talk about land back and I think everyone should give our land back to us. But I also think it's really important that we return children and learning back to our lands and waters um, if we're gonna regenerate models of indigenous education. And I'll stop. Thank you so much, Dr. Bang. That was really incredible. Um, and I think it gives us so much to think about. Um, I'm gonna actually at this point, um, hand it over to uh, Babalwa Quinelli, who's going to um, uh, facilitate our Q and A for the next um, 13 minutes or so. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pass it over. So for everyone who has a question or comment for Dr. Bang, please feel free to put that in the chat. And then um, we'll get to as many questions as we can in the time we have left. Thank you so much, Dr. Strom and Dr. Bang. Thank you so much for that presentation. Absolutely beautiful. I think the good part about me facilitating the questions is that I get to ask mine first. <laughs> and I do want to say, certainly people drop them in the chat. Um, and my area expertise is in mental health and with trauma. And so the question that I have is if you could tell us a little bit about um, some of the things that you've observed through these activities around the children being able to critically think and navigate their global environment and any changes that you've seen in terms of their ability to sort of manage what's happening with their, with their own ability to regulate themselves um, and connection to the earth and healing and mental health and things like that as well. Um, and then I have a second part of that question around COVID, but I'll leave it at that first one first. Yeah, yeah I appreciate the question. Um, we have a whole other version of this talk about how we're cultivating different affective and social emotional landscapes through land-based learning. Um, and I think it's profound to me how much I've continued to be pulled in that way. Um, there's a couple of things that we learn pretty quickly is that kids outside um, need to learn how to be outside again, but then the self-regulation happens because there aren't walls to bounce off of, frankly. Um, and what we see is that, well, that we also see much different movement. Um, the idea that learning and self-regulation means we're still really comes out of knowledge transformations out of European ideas around rationality. Um, and so the movement back to bodies on lands means that children can use their bodies to learn in really different ways. And we see that behavior. We still have, like I said, for about 40% of my kids are in foster care and by school standards have all kinds of problems. I can't tell you how many families will end up in tears because they'll come through a week of our program and we never say their kids are bad. And they will end up crying at the end of the week and said, I haven't had a week like this in years. Um, and so part of what I'm saying about this is that I think that actually um, through um, relationships to land, and we have old teachings about this too, the self-regulation is actually co-regulation with our lands and waters. I, and, and I think that that matters far more than we understand yet actually. But I'll also say this, um, we are tracking um, what people have been calling climate anxiety in young people, right? There's huge escalations and indigenous community suicidation is a massive problem. Um, our suicide rates are higher than anybody else's in the world. Um, and what we're also seeing is I wanna say those lands and waters based, uh, based relations are really important to this. But the move that you just saw away from only stories of harm to our people I actually think is really critical too. I think that one of the worries that I have about critical pedagogy, quite frankly, is that our kids have remarkable language. I can tell you, I have nine and 10 year olds that can tell you all about settler colonialism. They know that word, that's not a hard word. They can read you power up and down. Where their muscles are atrophied is imagining indigenous thriving in the future. And so flipping the terms of stories so that our harms or what I often call um, our negations aren't the center of the story is itself really important for the kind of healing work that I think you're pointing to. Um, and, and it's taken us a while to recognize how easy it is for us to reproduce harm-based paradigms, right? Which some people would call that's the recentering of a colonial ontology, which is what we saw with Ross. Right, we had all these things around us that signaled indigenous peoples. It's all indigenous learning environments, it's all indigenous teachers. 
And the word migration was still locked into a US settler colonial history, right? His paradigm of understanding our own migrations back and forth across North America from indigenous communities hadn't existed yet. He hadn't yet learned that migration isn't settler colonials terms to own. And I would just argue that that's true for all humans, right? We're in an era where forced migrations across the globe have to do with racial capitalism and enslavement and, and forced migrations in lots of ways. But people have been migrating across continents far before this area. Um, and, and I think sometimes we accept a kind of temporal frame that is just not serving us well um, the way that I do this with leaders is I often say, so what's going to be the traditional story that our people tell in 500 years about what we learned in these times? And most people can't imagine the production of ongoing indigenous knowledges in 500 years. So it like that idea of projecting our future is actually hard for people. So that's a long winded way to say it's all over the place. Um, but I do think the co-regulation with land um, we are just beginning to learn about how important that is. And I, I couldn't agree more. And I'm, um, I think there's a question in the chat that I'll yield to that one rather than the one that I was going to ask. And so this one came from actually a couple of people. And so one a question about the native and non-native alliances to facilitate educational reparations via access to land owned by non-native people. So that was a sort of like a question and wondering, I, it sounds like some thoughts about that as well. Yeah, I mean, one thing at the deepest level, property ownership is at the big, is at the foundations of the problem of coloniality, just to say, right? Land ownership, um, is a colonial paradigm, and there's a problem with it in the long run. However, so I just want to say that, I, I mean, we'll continue to protect our territories, and that is necessary. Mm -hmm. But we didn't used to talk about owning our lands. That is the current paradigm to negotiate within the current political consequences. So part of what I'm getting at here is that I think this question is really important. What would it mean? Um, and how is it that we can recognize that people could be thinking differently about individualized ownership or non-Native people in control of our territories? What would just access? And I don't really love access as a word either, but just relationships. Um, if we think about private ownership as the perpetual prevention of right relations for indigenous peoples with our original territories, private owners could decide to do something different with that. Um, I will tell you, you're in California and there's differences in the Midwest. We're pretty far from the possibility of non-native people opening up their territories for uh, indigenous use, but I really love it. And I feel like we do have some stories of people recognizing like, actually return of land is real. Like that's not metaphorical. Um, and I think when we think about and understand the projected changes to the land base of, the, of North America and climate change over the next 20 to 50 years, this actually becomes a very material conversation. Land bases are changing pretty significantly in the oncoming decades. So what it's going to look like for us to take seriously indigenous territories and our rights to continue to have territory is not a small political conversation. Thank you. Um, I have a couple more questions and we only have five minutes left. So I, oopsie, there, whoop, another one just popped in. Um, so this question is, um, that's talking about, can you talk more about the relationship between Afro and Indigenous? And, and that was something that was a conversation that I think that you're having at um, AERA. Mm -hmm. um, and... So let's answer that one. And then I have um, another question right after that one. Yeah, so there's two, there's at least two really important dimensions. One of the reasons I show that map with all the purple territory yeah. is mm -hmm. in the United States, people think about indigenous people as a racial category. Indigenous peoples are multiracial. There are indigenous peoples all over the globe. You go to Botswana, there are tribes with homelands, right? And then there are people who are Botswanan that are nation states, both black. Right, but the ways that racialization works in the United States, we think about native people as a race. 
So there's one way to just be clear. Sometimes I think that we project US-based racialization on indigeneity in a way that actually doesn't serve indigenous sovereignty. Um, the second piece about this, um, and Kameis does this beautiful work, um, and, and if we think about what has happened um, with black people and the diaspora of black folks is when do black people become non-indigenous? Why and in what service? If we actually know the historical record, early enslaved indigenous black Africans didn't forget that they were indigenous, that there was a process through the US that made people non-indigenous black people. Um, and I do think that as people, if we, if we disrupt the kind of what temporalities are we thinking from, it's really important, I would argue, for us to recognize what does it mean for peoples to be stripped of their indigeneity? Well, people we call Latinx right now often are indigenous peoples from someplace else as well, right? So there's a deep process of racialization. There's another piece to this that I'm sure is partly in question, and I would really recommend, there's a lot of growing beautiful work about this, um, is what do we, how do we make sense of indigenous peoples who don't live on their own territories? Right, and how, what are the right relations there? I wanted to demonstrate in Seattle, even when we are indigenous peoples, I'm from the Great Lakes, these are my territories. Seattle, I'm not indigenous to Seattle. So within indigenous communities, we are already making sense of what it means to be indigenous to a place and what it means to be in right relations with indigenous peoples whose territories we're on. And I think that the trouble with that is that we don't always understand and haven't really explored what would it mean to actually think indigeneity forward. Um, and then the last thing that I'll just say really clearly, um, I, I do think black and indigenous communities in the US for, and what I mean by that is black communities that are not currently claiming their indigeneity, which is different than black Indians. So that's the other thing to say, right? We have black Indians in the United States. And often when we talk about this, black Indians get erased and are either black or Indian and not actually living these intersections. Part of what I'm getting at is that the language of, of race and the language of coloniality, I don't always know are serving us well in either realm. So we are connect, we're constructing antagonisms from a settler colonial time frame. I would argue, um, that perpetuate um, ongoingness. And here's the other problem, is that we have some tribal nations, frankly, that have enacted profound anti-Blackness. Um, and then we have some Black Indians who have mobilized the US on individual rights paradigms to erode sovereignty. So if we look at the court cases and how they've played out, it's really um, a disfiguring, I think, of everybody in the process. Um, and I do think that, I, I think one thing I get, I just had a legislature say, until you can get um, Choctaws to change something. And I said, okay, here's the thing. We have probably 10 nations who have enacted some problematic anti-Blackness. There are 576 nations. It's actually a racialized logic to suggest that each indigenous nation is equal to each other. It's like saying, um, unless Kenya does something, then I'm not gonna do anything in Florida, right? Like there's a way in which some of the racialized logics that are playing out in the tensions that are building is actually a problem because it erases indigeneity both locally in the United States as well as globally. So I, I would argue, and I, you know, the other thing is, is that one of the broader things that I don't know that people understand is um, while forced exclusion of Black folks in the United States was the key construct for white supremacy, forced inclusion was the key simultaneous construction for native people, right? And so it means that our justice movements have actually started from slightly different impulses because of the way that that was constructed. Um, and until we understand why we have those deep distinctions, I think we can be positioned to be antagonistic with each other. Um, and I think the other thing to say is, so next year is 2024, it's the 100 year anniversary of native people's forced citizenship. And it's when we became citizens of the United States where native people weren't allowed to be citizens in Arizona, it didn't happen until the eighties. 
Um, we didn't have, so partly why the point about this is, is the hold is that I think for much deeper dialogues than we're currently having, we need to figure out how to get whiteness and white supremacy and settler colonialism out of the center of our relations. That's right. Thank you so much for that response. I know that we're out of time and that is a conversation that I personally, I'm sure everyone here is looking forward to having, hopefully sooner than later. So thank you. And I am turning it back over to Dr. Strong, right? We are, oops, sorry, we're over. over That's time. okay. No, it's okay. Thank you so much, Babalwa. Um, Dr. Dr. Bang, on behalf of our, our department um, of CSU East Bay, thank you so, so much for your time tonight and sharing uh, your research with us and the work that you're doing um, to make a difference on the ground in communities and schools. Um, so thank you so much. And thanks, everybody, for coming. Thanks for having me. Be well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Be well. That was so fantastic, so action packed. I'm so happy <laughs> I was here. I told all my students about it, but they're busy doing their ed TPAs, and it's just you know that time of year. So thank you all. And Ardella, I just wanted to say um, I wrote you last week, and I just wanted to like be visible. So I saw you in the elevator, but and I said hi, but you're like, who's that? <laughs> So I'm an ad, a lecturer, so I'm not here that much, but I'm just glad to be here tonight. Hi, Mari. Bye. Nicole, thank you so much. It was great to see you here. <laughs> Bye, Katie.